Hello again, everyone. Welcome back. We're going to carry on with building on our knowledge of polymers. We know that they are covalently bonded chains of, for the most part, hydrocarbons. We've covered the relative structure of each and have alluded to properties on the basis of their lengths. In this part of the lecture, we'll get into some more fundamental aspects as to why this is the case. Recalling that there are three main bonding types of materials, covalent, myonic, and metallic. These are primary bonding types, and they are down to the transfer or sharing of electrons. We know that polymer chains are covalently bonded, and this bond is the strongest among the three primary types. This type of bond is on the basis of sharing electrons, and therefore there is a high charge density between atoms. Furthermore, we've also covered the directionality aspect of how the carbon-carbon bond manifests in polymer chains. However, there are other bonding aspects that give many synthetic polymers their property. Before we do that, let's look at one of the more prevalent synthetic polymers that's used in a wide range of consumer and transportation applications. ABS, a polymer of the MERS, acrylonitrile, butadiene, and styrene. Changing the relative ratio of each of these MERS, the ratio of X to Y to Z, can have a wide-ranging effect on the overall final properties, not just the overall number of them that contributes to their length. Another widely used polymer is polyurethane, often used as a structural adhesive. There are many cars which are rolling around right now with polyurethane-bonded chassis. The MERS are different, and a large part of the chain is comprised of aromatics, represented by the hexagons. Each of these fully drawn out would look like the ring hanging off of the styrene and ABS. The big difference in the structure between these two polymers is that ABS is a branched polymer with largely random copolymerization, while polyurethane is a cross-linked or networked polymer. Polyurethane has covalent bonds acting between chains. That is, there is a mer or part of a mer that can appear in the middle of the chain where cross-linking can take place. This provides a much more robust structure, but at the expense of being recyclable. Primary bonds will need to be broken at cross-links. ABS, on the other hand, is widely recyclable and will have similar strength to polyurethane. But it doesn't have to rely on cross-linking to achieve this. Let's now examine why. The answer is secondary bonding. Secondary bonds are those that manifest without the transfer or sharing of electrons. As a clarification of terminology, I use secondary bonding to describe all intermolecular forces. In earlier courses, you may have had these referred to as something else. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as collectively as van der Waals forces, or any mix of dipole, hydrogen, or even London dispersion forces. When I describe their layout and structure, I'm sure you'll be able to make the connection to previous terminology you may have encountered. Classified in terms of strength, permanent dipole have the most energy associated with them, followed by hydrogen, which is a specific type of permanent dipole associated with the hydrogen bond, and finally intermittent dipole or dispersion forces. Dipole bonds are often fairly weak and exceeded by hydrogen. However, there are ion-induced dipoles, which are stronger than hydrogen, which is why I've ranked these the way I have. Can be instead of is. Your mileage will vary, as will whether hydrogen bonds are just a specific type of dipole. The actual strengths are down to which molecules are under consideration. These all have bonding energies, which are significantly lower than covalent primary bonds. For example, 346 kilojoules per mole for the carbon-carbon bond. But all these secondary bonds add up. I'll now describe the nature of each of these secondary bonds in detail subsequently. First off, we have dipole secondary bonding. This bond type occurs as dipoles arise in a molecule comprised of two atoms with equal and opposite electrical charges. Each molecule therefore forms a dipole that attracts other molecules, as I've shown here, with a hydrogen bonded to chlorine. The electron density on the chlorine is much higher than the region containing the hydrogen, 
and therefore there is a permanent dipole that forms. This is an arrangement which is employed by PVC. The intermittent appearance of a chlorine atom on the chain can create locations that can attract other chains or the chain itself. A specific type of permanent dipole secondary bonding is the hydrogen secondary bond. This is the type of bond that decides the relatively unique behavior of water, but also other specific attributes of polymers. Polyurethane's oxygen containing myrrh can employ this to some effect, but there are others that make a specific employ, for example, nylon. Typically, polymers which employ hydrogen bonding are more sensitive to humidity. Nylon, for example, is very susceptible to swelling or volume changes with exposure to humidity changes. Last, being significantly weaker than the two preceding, is dispersion bonding. This type of bonding is intermittent. That is, they are stronger and weaker depending on the location and circulation of electrons. These are sometimes referred to as London forces, and they are active in all polymeric materials, but are the most appreciated in polymers that do not have MERS or other components that form permanent dipoles, for example, polypropylene. The net effect of secondary bonding is that beyond mechanical entanglements, there are additional forces acting between polymer chains. If one were to take a single polymer chain and pull it, then it would deform elastically when drawn taut. Pulling on multiple polymer chains with mechanical and chemical entanglements, that is those brought about by secondary bonding between chains, this will result in a viscoelastic response. Deformation causes chains to move past each other by slippage, and the chains can move due to the degrees of freedom set up by the flexibility afforded by bonding angle between MERS. However, there is energy barriers associated with doing so, not just the movement itself, but also breaking of secondary bonds. This is a rate-dependent process, that is, governed by time. The overall load developed is therefore dependent on the strain rate, and on a reciprocal basis, the strain attained in the given time is dependent on the load. This is also a phenomenon which is seen in metallic systems. Creep. This will be described in greater detail in the following lecture. So as we've seen, the bonding within a polymer chain is covalent, whereas secondary bonds act between polymer chains. There is an order of magnitude difference in the bonding energies associated between the primary covalent bond and the other types of secondary bonds that can occur in polymers. Dipoles, hydrogen bonds, and dispersion bonds are all examples of secondary bonding that can occur, depending on the molecule and MER being considered. The end result of both mechanical entanglements and these secondary bonds is that the response of a polymer to loading is a strong function of strain rate or alternately, the amount of strain attained with a constant load is dependent on time. Until next time.